Nestled in the parklands between the city centre and North Adelaide is the Adelaide Oval Venue, a sports ground which initially opened back in 1871. With the capacity to hold over 53,000 individuals, it is a popular venue to host cricket tournaments and rugby and football matches. For Adelaide residents, though, it is perhaps best known for the Adelaide Oval Abductions, the name given to the disappearances of two young children who were attending a football game in the 1970s. This is Cold Case Detective. But first, I'd like to thank Aura for sponsoring today's episode. We cover a lot of cases here on Cold Case Detective, and sometimes the perpetrator seems to get off scot-free without ever paying for their crimes. But what if we told you that people are doing that right now to you? Those spam calls offering you the newest phone deal, or emails trying to get you to sign up for some questionable product, all stem from one initial issue, data brokers. While data brokers are legal, they are making a profit by selling your data to the highest bidder. Today's sponsor can help you fight back. Aura can identify data brokers and get them to take your name and number off the list. Not only that, Aura combines multiple services into one, and you can try them out for free for two weeks by using our link in the description, aura.com slash coldcasedetective. It's easy to use and means you can access a VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, antivirus, and more, all for one affordable price. Let Aura do the hard work of keeping your data safe online and stop the people profiting from your personal data. Use our link down in the description to try it out today and start your two week free trial. Have a look and see how much of your data is out there and available on the dark web. Take control of your data with Aura. On August 25th, 1973, 11-year-old Joanne Ratcliffe headed out with her parents, Les and Kathleen, her older brother, and a family friend known as Frank. On this day, a football match was held between Norwood and North Adelaide. Next to the Ratcliffes was four-year-old Kirsty Gordon, who was under the supervision of her maternal grandmother. Her parents, Greg and Christine Gordon, were not in attendance as they were visiting friends with their younger daughter in the town of Renmark. Both Joanne's family and Kirsty's held season tickets and sat together every week. As a result, they got to know one another. There was a strong element of trust between the two families, which is why Joanne was allowed to accompany Kirsty to the toilets that day. As a general rule, the Ratcliffes did not allow their children to go to the toilets during breaks or during the last quarter, but made an exception this day. At 3.45 p.m., Kirsty and Joanne went to the toilets. When they failed to return 15 minutes later, their families grew concerned and began to search for them. Joanne's mother, Kathleen, attempted to have an announcement made on the venue's PA system, but was rebuffed. It wasn't until 5 p.m., after a second attempt, that a report was put out across the venue. Still, nobody came forward, and the girls remained missing. The police were notified of the disappearance at 5.12 p.m. Authorities arrived promptly on the scene. Upon talking with witnesses, they came to understand that the girls were seen numerous times in the 90 minutes that elapsed between their departure for the toilets and the Oval's announcement. The first time the two were noticed was when they and several other children attempted to coax over a stray cat that was prowling around. The second was when an unknown man was seen carrying Kirsty. During this time, Joanne was reportedly seen looking distressed and hitting and punching the man as she screamed at him. Onlookers, though, thought nothing of the incident at the time. They assumed it was a family dispute and the girl was simply upset with her father. The last reported sighting of Joanne and Kirsty was of them on a bridge near Adelaide Zoo. 
A 14-year-old girl visiting with her father remembers seeing a man with the two girls. She told under investigation, I saw a man coming at a rapid pace towards us on the gravel path, carrying a young child. Following behind, running to keep up to him, was a girl, and she was absolutely punching this man as hard as she could in the back and saying, put her down, put her down, and she was so upset. The girl's description of the man matched that of the other eyewitnesses from earlier on inside the sports venue. It's worth noting that the advertiser reports that the girls were last seen by a young man who saw them near Port Road, close to the North Adelaide train station. Private investigators speculated that the girls were taken away from the area on a Red Hen train from this station. Although this case was high profile and attracted attention nationwide, the initial investigation soon hit a brick wall. A $5,000 reward was offered for information, but no notable leads emerged from the presented incentive. It was hard to believe that the girls had been taken in broad daylight in front of 13,000 witnesses and nobody recognized the man who'd committed the crime, but this appears to be the case. In the years since the girls' disappearances, there is some speculation that their case is linked to that of the Beaumont children, the infamous Australian case where three siblings, nine-year-old Jane, seven-year-old Anna, and four-year-old Grant, vanished near Adelaide in 1966. As a result of this possible connection, many of the suspects in the Beaumont case are suspects in this one too. According to witnesses in 1966, the Beaumont children were last seen in the company of a tall man with fairish to light brown hair, a medium build, and a thin face with a sun-tanned complexion. He appeared to be in his mid-thirties. Interestingly, a police sketch put together of the man seen with Kirsty and Joanne before they went missing, who was wearing a hat, resembled the description of the man seen with the Beaumont children. One suspect in the Beaumont case is Bevan Spencer von Einem, a suspected serial killer who was convicted in 1984 for the killing of a 15-year-old boy in Adelaide named Richard Kelvin. Von Einem snatched Richard on or around June 5th, 1983, and subsequently held him captive for five weeks, drugging, torturing, and sexually abusing him. His body was found seven weeks after he vanished on July 24th near One Tree Hill, a town on the outskirts of Adelaide. Von Einem was pinned down by investigators due to the fact that the hypnotic sedative Mandrax was found in Richard's body, and Von Einem was one of the people holding a prescription for it. Additionally, Von Einem's name rang a bell as he had been questioned in relation to the deaths of three young men and the alleged sexual assault of another. Fibers on Richard's clothing matched those found inside Von Einem's home. Another suspect in the Beaumont case is Derek Ernest Percy, another suspected serial killer who was a person of interest in the Wanda Beach murders, an unsolved case wherein two girls were killed at Wanda Beach in Sydney in January of 1965. In 1969, Percy was arrested for the murder of a 12-year-old named Yvonne Tui. He had also attempted to abduct her friend, an 11-year-old boy, who later identified Percy's vehicle. Percy initially denied involvement, despite being caught washing blood off his clothes by police, but he eventually led them to the young girl's body. Investigators suspected that Percy was harboring paedophilic tendencies and found journals describing and illustrating his many sexual fetishes. At his trial, Percy was found not guilty by reason of insanity and was kept in police custody indefinitely. He died from lung cancer in 2013, aged 64. The final two suspects in the case are believed to be the more likely perpetrators in the Adelaide Oval abduction. Arthur Stanley Brown was the main suspect in the slayings of Susan and Judith McKay in 1970. The two sisters, aged seven and five, lived in Townsville and were taken while walking to school one morning, just 300 meters from their residence. Two days later, their bodies were found at Anthill Creek. Susan had been sexually assaulted, strangled, and stabbed in the chest. Her sister, Judith, had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Brown was a suspect early on in the case, but a botched police investigation led to him living as a free man for the best part of three decades. 
Brown bears a notable resemblance to the police sketch created after the Adelaide Oval incident of the man in the hat who was seen carrying Kirsty and being hit by a distressed Joanne. Sue Laurie, the witness who saw the girls at the Adelaide Zoo when she was 14, identified Brown as the man with the girls that day. She saw him on a news program in 1998, 25 years after she'd last seen him and immediately recognized him. Speaking again with Under Investigation, Sue said she had a very clear picture in her mind of the offender and instantly knew that this man's face was the one she'd seen a quarter of a century ago. Years later, when I saw his photo, I instantly said, that's the man, that's the face. While he often showed himself as a quiet, polite, and hardworking man, employed as a carpenter for Queensland Department of Public Works, Brown's family members speak less generously of him. Merle Moss remembered, There was something about him when I first met him. I was only a kid. I just didn't like him. It was well known eventually through the family that he abused a lot of young girls, only girls around the area. By all accounts, Brown's horrific, illegal activities continued without repercussions for years, as he was never reported to the police, and, according to journalist Paula Donovan, he would carry out his crimes under the radar. She stated, When you go through the victims of the child sex abuse statements, they consistently talk about him wearing his maintenance uniform. He's the guy fixing something at school. One of his family talked about him encouraging the students to call him uncle. She added that he would bring many of his victims home and assault them in the house he shared with his wife. Merle Moss recalled that he had a secret room inside the property. We found all these books, all true stories, apparently, of women that had been mutilated and raped and bottles of wine. Little did we know at that time that that's what he was doing to young girls. Merle also remembered having suspicions about Brown and his possible connection to the Townsville slayings. According to Paula Donovan, he was unsurprised when investigators showed up for him 28 years later. In December of 1998, Brown was finally charged with the crime. This was around the same time that Sue Laurie saw his face on the news and immediately identified him as the man she had seen with Joanne and Kirsty back in 1973. Unfortunately, however, the trial resulted in a hung jury. Though a retrial was ordered, Brown was found unfit for trial. He died in 2002 without ever being convicted of the Townsville slayings or the disappearances of Kirsty and Joanne. Interestingly, Brown and the police sketch resembled another known pedophile in Australia, Stanley Arthur Hart. The Adelaide Oval case largely came to a standstill until 2009, when a prisoner named Mark Trevor Marshall gave a written confession claiming that he and his grandfather, Hart, had been at the Adelaide Oval on the day that Joanne and Kirsty vanished. In the written piece, he claims that his grandfather was the one responsible for taking the children from the venue and later taking their lives. Hart died in 1999. Journalist Brian Littley obtained a copy of the confession, labeling it horrific and adding, they abducted the girls and took them into the country and they were murdered. He stated his belief that there were enough details in the note that it was possible Marshall was telling the truth. Notably, Littley isn't alone in this feeling. Bill Hayes, a private investigator and former police detective, has also stated that there are things in there that compel you to think that he does know what he's talking about. Joanne's sister, Susie, has also read the notes and told under investigation, there are too many pieces of information and details in there that are irrefutably real. There's details in there that he's come up with that he could not have known unless he'd actually met her personally. Reportedly, Hart had been interviewed following the incident in 1973, and according to Bill Hayes, there is a witness who believes he saw the two young girls at Hart's home just days after they went missing. In 2015, Two properties belonging to Hart, one in Prospect and the other in Yatina, were searched by authorities. The home in Prospect was abandoned at the time, but had an underground bunker which was filled in in 1975, after the disappearances, and in 1973 onwards, only Hart had access to the house. It was his childhood home. Meanwhile, the property in Yatina had two wells on its grounds, both of which were excavated. Unfortunately, nothing of note was discovered on either property. 
In 2013, Joanne's sister asked the authorities to look into the background of their family friend, known only as Frank, who was there that day when the girls vanished and whether or not he was involved. She recalled that he was somebody with good knowledge about the girls' routine behaviors during football matches. And according to Joanne's mother, Frank left his seat for around 30 minutes before the girls disappeared. He later remained seated and did not aid in the search for them after the family became concerned that they were missing. Kirsty's grandmother had also taken notice of Frank's odd behavior. It is unclear if he was ever questioned in regard to the disappearances. Kirsty and Joanne have never been found, and their case is still unsolved. The two girls disappeared on August 25th, 1973, from the sports venue, the Adelaide Oval. Joanne Ratcliffe was 11 at the time. She is described as a white girl with brown hair, which was in pigtails when she vanished. She has a medium build and was wearing a white blouse, black tank top, black jeans, white shoes, and white socks. When she disappeared, she was taking four-year-old Kirsty Gordon to the toilet. Kirsty is described as a white girl with blonde, shoulder-length hair and blue eyes. She was three foot four when she disappeared and has a fair complexion with faint freckles. She has a slight scar above the bridge of her nose and two birthmarks, one at the base of her spine and one below the hairline. When she was last seen, she was wearing a white pleated skirt, purple jumper, white pantyhose, and brown lace-up shoes. A reward of up to $1 million is still on offer to anyone who provides information leading to the discovery of the remains or information leading to a conviction. If you have any information on the case, you can contact Crime Stoppers on 1-800-333-000. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations. And remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.